Well, welcome to the webinar. This is Joe Folkman. I'm here with my good friend and author colleague, uh, Jack Zanger. Jack, Hi. good to have Hi. you here. Thank you very much. Uh, we are very excited about uh, this webinar. We think this is one of the most critical skills, and it's becoming more critical today, Jack. I, th I think change is everywhere, uh, and, and we're seeing it everywhere. And leaders are, are, this is a critical skill for leaders, and so we're going to give you some insights into that today and help you understand it just a bit. Now, if you're just joining us, uh, we'd like you to complete a self-assessment. To do that, you'll go to the link bit.ly slash L-E-A-D-C. Uh, it only takes eight to ten minutes, so you can do it while we're introducing the, the webinar here. You'll get a feedback report that'll show you your uh, preference for five different uh, approaches to leading change and your effectiveness on those five approaches. So if you want to do that, do it right now. If you put in your email address, you'll get your results sent to your email. If you didn't put your in, in your email address, be sure to copy the results on your screen before you hit the submit button. So let's talk about the objectives today for the webinar. Uh, several years ago, Warren Bennis said that more is written about leadership and less is known than any other topic. And if you Google leadership on, on, on Google, you would find thousands of things to do. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not very helpful. And this is a real dilemma with people that are trying to improve their leadership. The, the big question is, well, what do I work on? There's a thousand things to do. Now, a decade ago, Jack and I faced this very problem. And we actually looked at over 2,000 behaviors. And what we were looking for was what we call differentiating behaviors, behaviors that if you were really good at it, it made a huge difference. And if you were bad at it, made, it made a bigger difference. Uh, but we found that in all these behaviors, there were a short list that made the biggest difference. And what we did is we encapsulized those in, in, in our first model, which was 16 competencies, our second model, 19 competencies. One of those competencies was what we call champion change or leading change. That's what we're going to talk about today. But what we want to do is, is because this, this, these competencies are so important, we want to give you what we call a micro learning experience, a very short experience where you can dive into that competency, get an idea about how you're doing, and then take some uh, actions to change. So the data we're going to give you today is based on research from over 100,000 leaders across the globe. And what we want to do is help you understand about your effectiveness on these five enabling behaviors but also provide you some insights about this whole topic of champion change. Now, lots of webinars you want to sit back and listen. We'd rather on this webinar you dive in and you actually participate and you engage yourself because we think this is a critical behavior for every person and you actually select a topic for you to improve uh, at the end of the webinar, we're going to give you access to a development guide to help you create a development plan for improvement. So one last reminder, if you haven't done it yet, and if you're just joining the webinar, it's going to be very helpful for you to do a pre-assessment. Uh, it's very short, eight to 10 minutes. Go to this link, bit.ly slash L-E-A-D-C. Uh, answer the questions and you'll be ready. We're going to give you some insights before we go into that. Jack? Yes, I guess now the big question is, why is change necessary to survive? And we think that there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, it's certainly you're familiar with lots of them. New technologies are emerging. The market opportunities are rapidly evolving. Customers tell us that they want different things, want new, new outcomes. Uh, the global economy is going through real turbulence. Uh, it provides new opportunities through expanding geography for many organizations. Uh, there's competition from uh, companies who have been our long-term competitors. 
And there's also disruption from by new competitors that are emerging. And the extent of this was uh, interestingly measured by our friends at uh, the Association for Talent Development. A study they did in, in 2017 indicated that seven out of 10 companies had experienced a major change in the last two years. And these changes involved such things as a major expansion, not just normal growth, or a major downsizing. Uh, they involved a major structural change where the organization was kind of reconfigured. It may have involved a merger. Uh, and then, of course, you're familiar with a lot of the, the, the changes that are swirling about us, digital transformation, new product introductions, the world economic trends. As we record this webinar today, there's all kinds of turbulence in the uh, world economy with tariffs going back and forth between uh, major economic powers uh, and political changes. Uh, uh, we're living in the midst right today of, of Brexit and, and other major political changes. So there are all these things happening. Jack, I'm wondering about those three organizations, those three companies that didn't. <laughs> yeah. Are they still in business? <laughs> well, that raises a very interesting question, which is the next slide. So if you take a step back in, in history, um, it is fascinating to look at the original Fortune 500 companies. In 1955, they were identified. Now, 62 years later, only 60 out of the original 500 are still being listed. <laughs> the net result was that of the original Fortune 500, 86% or 88% did not survive. Wow. And among those major kind of heavyweight organizations, uh, they you know, used to spend an average of 33 years on the S&P 500 list. It's now being forecasted that will drop to 14 years. The bottom line is that half of the S&P 500 companies will be replaced in the next decade. That's, that is <laughs> it's just, just it's know, a little bit chilling, isn't it? It is. Now, we want to be a little more precise when we talk about organizational change. Uh, clearly, every a child is changing as, as he or she grows, and you can measure it on the, the doorway of your home and you know draw lines. Uh, but that isn't the kind of change we're talking about. That The first level of change is a kind of just gradual, normal evolution of organizations. A second kind of change, a uh, second level of change, is change that requires some adjustment in how people behave, some new practices, some new behaviors, uh, but they don't require necessarily a whole new way of thinking or dramatic changes in behavior. But there's a third level of change, and that's what we'll be focusing on today. This requires employees to, to think and to behave quite differently. It generally modifies the organization's culture. And so when you hear about an organization that's evolving from being a product organization to a customer experience organization, uh, that requires a whole new level of thinking and interacting. So today's webinar is very much focused on how you can successfully lead that third kind of change. What specific behaviors help that to occur? And what's the process that you might want to think about, know about, and consider following as you personally are involved in leading that kind of change? So we're going to give you uh, some research, and the research is gathered from over 1 million respondents from across the globe. And we analyzed our 360 database, and, and we're looking at data from over 100,000 leaders. And what we're trying to give you is the results. Each leader was assessed on their effectiveness and the importance of leading change for them. And we're going to share those results with you. And I think it's really interesting to see what that tells us. Now, on this page, you'll see the importance and the effectiveness ratings. And 
if you look at this by level, uh, top management, senior management, middle management, supervisors, you'll see that 32% of our top management group received the feedback that leading change was one of the four most important competencies that they should focus on. 29% uh, senior, 24% uh, middle, and then the supervisors only 14%. So that's, that's, is this important? Now, on the other graph, what we're showing you is how good they were. We measured them on four specific behaviors that we think are very connected to leading change. Surprising thing was is that the group that was most effective were the supervisors, <laughs> right? And you think, well, that's crazy. Uh, but if you think about a supervisor, when they're leading change, they're changing a work group. That's a whole lot easier than changing the organization, which is the role of top management. And so I think the expectations are so much different and and uh, you can see that that with senior management, with all that emphasis on that they should be good at leading change, uh, their score is not that great. It's at the 53rd percentile, only three points above average. We then looked at gender. And as you can see, the importance was about the same between the two groups. And the effectiveness was pretty close. Uh, you know, males were at the 50th percentile. Females were at the 53rd percentile. And, you know, Jack and I talked about this before. Should we show this slide? Because it's not that different. The point, the, the reason I said, yeah, let's show it. Because I think a lot of people think that women are better at, uh, you know, those kinds of behaviors that are nurturing, you know, like, like relationships and collaboration. But this is, a, this is not a soft skill. This is a hard skill. Uh, leaning change is a hard skill. And, and so it, it, it is noticeable, I think, and it's actually statistically significant because we have 40,000 men and 22,000 women here. So we've got a big sample that that three per point difference is statistically significant. And women tend to be slightly better at leading change. And, and Jack, you will tell us a reason <laughs> why that, <laughs> right. it, it's all that practice that they get changing men. I don't know. Juggling all this stuff. Juggling all Many these forces. things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the next one I think is fascinating because we went through uh, different functions. And I think the thing that catches your attention on there, if you look at the importance rankings and you look at HR uh, training, 41% of those people were, were told that leading change was one of the four most important competencies. Right. Now, you know, I don't know that they, they know that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you could see that IT, 31%, and then marketing, 29%, and it goes down from there. Now, if you look on the right on the effectiveness, and you see in the parentheses, you see that, that we, we showed you the ranking on the importance. And if you look down in the middle of that graph, you can see HR and training. And even though that's the most important, uh, their effectiveness on it isn't, it's, it's 45th and 44th percentile. So they're not that great at it, but there's a really strong expectation. The funny thing is that the group that's the best is sales. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they were told it was the, the least important. So thing. assuming that most of our audience on, on this call has some connection with the HR function, we thought that was useful information for you to uh, be aware of. Yeah, it may, may be. A, a, and, and it's probably not big news to you because in, anytime there's a change effort, uh, people start looking at you uh, for advice. So what's the impact of leading change? If I'm good at leading change, how much does it affect how I'm going to be viewed as a leader? Now, this is profound. If you're really bad at leading change, <laughs> people put you <laughs> in the 10th percentile on your overall leadership effectiveness. They, they think you're a bum, uh, the, basically. But if you're in the 90th percentile, they put you at the 92nd percentile in terms of leadership. You, you can, that is an absolute clear trend. And, and Jack, you actually made this statement. One of the most distinguishing differences between good and great leaders is how adept they are at bringing about change. Uh, you want to explain Yeah, no, that? I just think that uh, 
years ago, I, I think it was John Gardner who said that the major distinction between what we often think of as management versus leadership is the the ability to lead change, to bring about to bring about change in the organization. And I think this is really expressing how important leading change is as a about behavior. Well, and, and and we're saying, hey, it's even more important today than it was in the past. Uh, now, listen, when anybody comes to me and says, you got to change, I am not excited. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm ticked off. I'm like, what? I mm-hmm. <laughs> can't believe it. Mm-hmm. And so one of the things we wanted to do is we wanted to look at the correlation between leading change and engagement of employees. Would, would people that let a lot of change, would employee satisfaction go down or up? Uh, the results were profound and basically said that the people that were bad at leading change had low engagement of employees. The people that were great at leading change had employees at the 75th percentile on their engagement. There's an absolute clear correlation between being good at that and being good at uh, or having engaged employees. And again, uh, employee engagement increases as a leader's ability to change. And I think part of what it gives them is that sense that this place is going to be around. We're, we're, a, we're a, uh, a business that's going to, going to attack problems and not ignore them. Uh, the third one, we ask people if they were confident that the organization would achieve its strategic goals and then your ability to lead change. And you can see that as people are better at leading change, the confidence that they'll achieve their strategic goals go way up. And again, this is a a strong, strong uh, uh, trend here. So uh, the ability to lead change is a key skill for leaders. Great leaders uh, need to lead change. Uh, Employees who are uh, employees reporting to leaders who are effective at leading change are much more satisfied and and they also have a greater ability to achieve uh, the the strategic goals. So, Which now brings us to the big question uh, about what is it that leaders can do to be more effective at leading change? And I think, you know, for some people, the initial simplistic view is that Leading change is all about pushing. It's about pushing people to, you know, just go ahead and do it. Uh, you know, you, you can do this. It's a hard thing, but yes, you can, you know, suck it up and do it. Uh, don't don't worry about the the risks. Just you know, pr- proceed. Uh, you, you know, it's just making making changes is a, is a process, and they, they they relish locker room kinds of speeches, and they want to turn the speed dial up. And so maybe the first major message we'd like to convey to you is we don't think those things are, are, are a good explanation of how to lead change. Yes, uh, pushing brute force can have some positive results in the short term, but there's lots of broken glass that results. And, you know, people, they naturally go there. I mean, a little bit, a little bit of that is necessary. We don't have to encourage more of it <laughs> because you'll you'll just go there. You'll just say, we got to do this, right? And and it's kind of natural. So we want to go back to the thing that Joe mentioned earlier. So our research involved over a, a million people completing a 360-degree feedback assessment pertaining to about 88,000 leaders and individual contributors uh, around their how they were perceived in their ability to lead change. And then we began to analyze our data and say, what were those behaviors that seemed to kind of stand out and be descriptive of this group of people who were seen as being so good at leading change? And there were five fundamental behaviors that emerged that appeared to be enabling this change. And you see them listed here on the screen, fostering innovation, uh, being able to act quickly, uh, maintaining a strategic perspective, developing external perspectives, and finally being inspiring and motivating. And we'd like to now cover each one of these in a little more depth and think with you about about them. Uh, And so the, the first one, you know, this, 
fostering innovation. Uh, the point we really want to emphasize here is that the leader himself or herself is not always the one who comes up with all the good ideas, but they indeed create the environment where ideas are welcomed and, and, and they, are, they are creating this environment which pulls innovation and ideas for change from the people around them. And so we, we want to be sure you, you see this emphasis on fosters innovation, not that they, are on, not that they themselves are the, are the only source of innovative ideas. Yeah, and I mean, people tend to kind of go to these, just grind it out. Just, you know, it's hard and we got to do it. There's always a better way. There's always a, a, an innovation that can help you change. The second one is this acting quickly. And uh, the analogy I like to use is pulling off that bandage. You know, mm -hmm. you just you just know when you're standing there holding that bandage, it's going to hurt. And but boy, you know, if you take it slow, it just hurts more. It's just worse. Ripping it off always is better. And and what we've seen is 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 in our data this absolute strong correlation between a, a leader's speed and their ability to lead change. Just get in there and get it done and get it over and and, and move on. And I think that ability to move quickly is is a terrific ability. It makes change less painful, and it also makes it more successful. The third element that emerged was this notion of maintaining strategic perspective. Um, the idea that the, the effective leader is not kind of wrapped up in just day-to-day -day tactics, but truly has, in his or her mind, a longer, broader strategy. So they aren't asking people to simply run faster or, or go more quickly, but they're walking on a, toward, toward, a, toward a direction that they are providing a compass that says, here's where we are going. Too often the organization gets caught up in the change process and forgetting to link the, the change that's being requested to some broader strategic objective. You know, one thing that really has struck me as I've uh, been in the business world now for, for a number of decades, and that is that the senior people at the top tend to have a greater tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, your, your, your tolerance kind of depends on what level you are in the, in the hierarchy, because you feel when you're in a more senior position that you have more control. So I think the importance of strategy is, is really emphasized for the people at the lower levels they need greater clarity, greater precision. They want to have a clearly spelled out three-year to five-year plan that lets them know in a more detailed kind of way. Uh, they have less tolerance for the kind of leave, leaving things kind of loose and, and not having a clear strategy. Uh, the other thing I'd add to that, Jack, is if you tell them once, that's not enough. <laughs> no. These are think of think of your teenagers. You know, when you had teenagers, you, you know, if you told them once, that wasn't enough. You needed to, you know, say it again, say it again, say it again, <laughs> and, and and you know, this needs to be repeated. And I think it's the repetition that makes. Until they get sick of it, and you get sick. Yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But well, by the time both. you're sick of it, they get it, right? <laughs> The, th the next one is this external perspective, and you know what happens when we get uh, when we when we get busy with a change, when we're you know trying to go through these traumatic times, we're focused inside. We're focused on what's going to happen. It's what's going on in the company, what we're doing, what we're going through, and we quit looking outside. We quit looking at what our competitors are doing, what other companies are doing, what our customers want. This is terrible. And and keeping a really clear vision of what other people are doing, where they're going, what's the trends, that is critical to this whole change process. And that brings us to the, uh, the fifth and, and final one of these uh, elements that emerged. Uh, Ten years ago, well, more than a decade ago, when we did our original research, we learned that the single most powerful leadership competency that we measured at that time was this ability 
to be inspiring and motivating. It was the one that impacted employee commitment the most. It was the one that employees said that they wanted from the leader to whom they reported. Uh, we know that it has a tremendous impact on how the organizations function. Uh, so again, as we've said, many leaders' first impulse when they begin thinking about needing to bring about a change is to push. And here we're saying, yes, there are times when push is appropriate, but very, very much it needs to be accompanied by a willingness to help pull, to listen to people, to find out what they think, to engage them, enlist them. Uh, and when leaders combine this push and pull, uh, then they have much greater success. And so I would say that one of the big ahas from our research is this need to have the combination of, yes, there are times when being directive is right, the right thing to do. And then there are times when you need to sit back and listen and hear what people are thinking and feeling and really enlist their help and assistance in bringing about necessary change. Another key, uh, you know, as we think about this ability to inspire and motivate others, it seems to be essential in, in, in the cultural change uh, that this ability is one of the key elements. Uh, you, you know, you can push a lot of things through, but you can't change culture with push. You've got to, you got, got to use some pull. And as you think about what inspiring does, the first thing it does is it's a way of creating reinforcement. And when I was a, a psych major, one of the first classes I took, we trained rats. And we learned about the power of reinforcement, of positive and negative reinforcement. And one of the, the key issues about reinforcement here is what's reinforcing people from not changing? What's rewarding people from staying the same? And, and understanding that and making sure that in the change process, we're rewarding good behaviors. The second thing is the role modeling. Uh, if you want to kill a change effort, then, then, you know, don't have the other senior leaders in the organization engage in it. Ask employees to do something that you don't do. This is the death of any change effort is inconsistent role modeling. We need to involve others. Uh, this cannot be command and control. Our engagement, our inspiration comes when there's some level of involvement from others. And the next thing, that, a key variable in being inspiring is the ability to communicate, letting people know when, where, what, and how. And you notice there's communicate, communicate, communicate. So once is not enough. Uh, we need to assess the culture. We need to figure out where it's at and how it's moving. And we need to prepare for the unexpected. What could go wrong? What's going to get in the way? The last thing is, is we really need to speak to the individual. And, and some of this stuff seems to go over the heads. But the, 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 the issues that what we're expecting every employee in this organization to do is X, that's critical in a change effort. So let me uh, just talk about, we've got these five behaviors. And we, with our large database, with this huge database that we have, we were able to, to really model the effect of, of being really good at these. And we also modeled the effect of just being above average. So let me show you what that means. If you weren't above average on any one of the five behaviors that we've just talked about, your average ability to change is the 18th, about the 19th percentile. If you were above average on one, that goes up to the 35th percentile, almost doubles. If you're just above average on one, on two, 45th percentile, on three, you're above average on your ability to change. If you're above average at three, four gives you to the 64th percentile. But if you're just above average on all five, your ability to change goes to the 81st percentile. Jack, when I looked at this, I thought, you know, that's interesting. Mm. There's that interaction effect. I mean, it looks to me like these, if we can do all of these reasons, not, not incredibly well, right. but if we can just be pretty good at all these, if we can sort of 
have the ability on all these, our ability to change, you know, it, it really is at the top 20%. Now, if you're above average on all of them already, if you push two of them to the 90th, you're, 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 you go up to 84th percentile, three to the 90th, the 98th, 89th percentile, and four, you go to the 92nd percentile. So the idea here is that if you're above average on all five skills, you're at the 81st percentile on leading change. There's a, what we call an interaction effect between these five skills. Uh, sort of, you know, doing one well helps you be better at the other, that, that, that these things are kind of interconnected between them. And now what I'd like you to do is look at your results. What we did is we assessed you on two things. One is your preference. What do you like to do? What are you drawn to? What gives you energy and excitement? And the other was your effectiveness. Well, which of these things am I really good at? Now, we're giving you your self-assessment ratings. We don't find those are as, <laughs> as, always as effective as feedback from not others. That's accurate. Was, was, you know. Yeah, and all our research is based on feedback from others. But we do find that the self-assessment is directionally correct. We've also provided you some feedback on the norms on those five, on the effectiveness on those five, so that you can check and see if you tended to rate yourself high or you rated yourself low and what the average is. And this average is based on 100,000 uh, people from across the globe, and, and that's the average score for the five. So how do you increase your effectiveness to lead change? Well, you look at your feedback, and, and the first thing you think about is, where's my passion? Where's my energy? The second thing is, well, how good am I at these dis different five skills? A third dimension you might want to consider is, what does the organization need me to do? In my job right now, which of these is the most critical? So if this were my feedback and I was thinking about Okay, where's my preference? You can see that on this feedback, uh, this person has a strong preference for acting quickly and inspires and motivates others. Where's my effectiveness? Well, my effectiveness on acting quickly is 3.5, but my effectiveness on inspires and motivates others is a 2.5. So that's a low effectiveness rating. If my organization in need is high, that is a great thing to work on because you've got a high preference. In other words, a lot of energy. you got a low effectiveness, so I'm not as good as I need to be, uh, but it's, that's pretty easy to improve. On the second one, you can see uh, an interesting one. So low preference, your lowest preferences are strategic perspective and external perspective. And uh, you can see that they're the lowest. And when you look at the effectiveness rating, actually external perspective got your lowest score. So that was a low, low. If your organization need is high there, that might be another one you might think about because the organization need is high, but your effectiveness is low. Your preference is lower, which means it's going to be harder. Uh, if you're low on all three, that's one where you go, eh. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> maybe I'll only be good at four of these things. Anyway, that gives you some logic for how to proceed. What we'd like you to do is select one behavior uh, that has the lowest score on your effectiveness and one that, uh, you know, would improve, would improving, would make a big impact on your current job. And then uh, one where you're, you're reasonably passionate about improving. And what we're going to do is give you some insights into how to improve that. Uh, so which behavior to choose? Well, choose one. Select one right now that you'd want to work on. And, and uh, you know, I, we'll, uh, we'd like you to encourage you to really do this and, and move forward on one thing. And that's something you're going to get out of the webinar today. And we want to be helpful by providing you some development resources. So at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will be asked to give us some feedback. If you are willing to kind of complete that little feedback instrument, then at the end of that, if you there will be a link that you can uh, open up for the development guide. So again, at the conclusion of the, today's webinar, 
you'll be asked to give some feedback to us on today's webinar. And when you complete that, you'll have this opportunity to download the development guide. So the final thing we want to do in our webinar today is to provide you with some thoughts about the process of leading change. I recall as a young graduate student uh, at UCLA uh, in the mid 1950s, which was a long time ago, I recall someone handing me this book on change. And I recall being a bit skeptical. How in the world can you write a book on something so broad and so seemingly vague as change? And I must confess that I still possess a little bit of skepticism about our ability to effectively address this very powerful topic. But we have learned some things. And so in the next couple of minutes, we'd like to share with you just some ideas that you might want to think about in terms of the process of leading change. Uh, some issues to consider we think are, first, is your organization capable of absorbing uh, the major change you're thinking about initiating. Uh, I attribute this idea to a longtime colleague, Daryl Connor, uh, who kind of had this, I think, useful metaphor about a sponge. Uh, if you have a sponge that's basically full of water, you can run the tap on it for as long as you want, <laughs> and it isn't going to absorb any more water. Uh, you have to kind of wring out the water and, and start again if you want it to, to absorb water. So the, the first idea is, you know, think about the uh, organization's ability to absorb change. Uh, secondly, is there a compelling argument that you can make that will either be clearly convey that this making this change is going to solve an immediate problem, or it's going to make things better in the future beyond what they are where they are today? If you can't make that compelling case, maybe the, the change process isn't going to have all that much success. And the third thing we'd want you to think about is. Um, Change really implies that people are going to behave differently. So Joe mentioned earlier about bringing this down to the behavioral level. What do you want people to do differently Monday morning? Um, and, and, you know, the most important changes usually require some new behavior. Now, some thoughts about the process of implementing major change. We're going to just suggest maybe five things that you would might want to think about when it comes to a change process. Again, it's can you create a, com a compelling story that explains why this change either solves an existing problem or makes the future even better? The second thing is we know that change is improved when people are serving as good examples or role models. So how will you involve senior leaders or, in, or people who are in, indeed very influential in your organization to, to be the, the examples of what change is all about? Change usually starts at the top and cascades to all layers and corners of the organization. Yes, it can be initiated in a, in a pocket, but if you really want to change the culture, it needs to be quite pervasive. The third thing we want to just remind you about is seldom do you start with a clean sheet of paper. There's always a history, and that history has some strengths, probably has some flat sides, but you should at least be aware of and honor the legacy of the organization. Know where, you start, where you're starting from and, and honor that, that culture that has existed. Uh, fourth, understand that organization change, organizations don't change, people change. And what we, what we describe as organizational change is really that aggregation, it's really that composite of lots of individual behavioral change. And the fifth thing is, how can you communicate consistently? How can you recognize what people are doing 
that show signs of really bringing this change about. And there is this huge benefit of repetition and consistency uh, in, 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 in the change activity. Now, it's always tempting to make something like this into a graphic formula. So <laughs> we've attempted to create this, this formula that we would invite you to think with us yeah, just, about. Just don't ask us to put numbers against <laughs> yeah, it. <laughs> right. No, don't, don't ask for the proof. <laughs> so we're proposing that successful change has the following elements in it. It's a strong, compelling idea, again, that sort of either solves a problem or will in, make things significantly better. To that, you add this whole communication process that, that the, the message is clear and it's compelling. And stories are, are great vehicles for making that communication come alive. The third element is this element of, of involvement that senior managers, managers, that middle managers, that key employees or, who are individual contributors really get on board. The higher the level of involvement, the more that people are involved, uh, and the more people that are involved, the greater the likelihood of the change being successful. And then finally, there's a there's a time element. Um, Oops, there's reinforcement. Oh, I'm sorry, and reinforcement. So what you can do to reward uh, the changes that are made. And Joe had mentioned this earlier, that, that people, people change when they, they know that it's being appreciated, it's being noticed. Uh, people can observe the change. Uh, and certainly there's this idea that you begin by picking the low-hanging fruit, uh, but then you begin to tackle more challenging issues and, re and reward people, recognize them, praise them in public, for what they are doing in this change process. You know, I, there's another element on that, Jack, and it's an interesting one. I think performance management, and here's the tough reality, some people aren't gonna change. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and, and that's where performance management yeah, comes in, in terms of saying, you know, are you on, you know, are you on the bus or are you off the bus? Yeah. And, and that's, that's part of the change process is just figuring out who's gonna join it. And if you're not, going to get on the bus, then get off the bus. And finally, our formula kind of um, calls up a, a notion of, of time. Uh, and again, when I was a young graduate student uh, a long time ago, uh, a very well-respected uh, scholar, Kurt Lewin, was one of the people who, first of all, began considering this whole change process. And he had a, a very interesting kind of way of viewing it. He, he viewed it as the change consists of, of unfreezing behavior and then bringing about a change and then refreezing into a, into a new shape or a new, new pattern. And, you know, that notion that it starts out kind of like a block of ice and something has to happen to unfreeze that block of ice. And if you unfreeze it, it kind of is, is more pliable and you can kind of reshape it into a new form. And that's what this change process is that we're talking about. But then you need to kind of be sure to kind of refreeze it and, and lock it into the, its new position. Because if, if you don't, it will tend to revert back where it had, it had been, which really kind of illustrates this, this idea that you see that below the line is this major force that we kind of all need to recognize, and that is there's lots of inertia. There's inertia in our personal lives, and there's inertia in organizations. And inertia is basically that phys physics principle that says if a body is resting and in steady state, it takes a lot of force to get it to move. <laughs> if it's moving in a certain direction, it takes a lot of force to get it to change the direction. Uh, or it gets a, a lot of force to kind of slow it down or speed it up. And so in, inertia is a, is a reality in the world of physics. It's a reality in the world of human behavior and organizational behavior. And so we're always fighting this tendency for the organization to have a, a strong component of basic inertia.
Jack, when we moved our offices, uh, we moved on a Friday. On Monday morning, I got in my car and I drove to our old <laughs> office. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and when I got there, I went, oh, <laughs> that's inertia, isn't it? <laughs> but inertia. the next day I got in my office and then I, I, I drove to the street before I recognized. <laughs> you, you know, it took about three days for me to get to the office. Well, I, I eventually got there, but you know what I mean, that inertia. Yeah. And there's this thing called plan continuation bias. <laughs> you know, if we have a plan, we're going to keep doing the same thing we did in the past. Right. And that's interesting. So in summary, let's just kind of take, talk about the takeaways from today's webinar. Uh, the pace of change has increased from the, from the past, and it gives every indication of continuing, if not accelerating. Secondly, we, we have the expectation that everyone should be willing and able to change. Uh, and clearly, the expectation we have is that leaders will set the example and will be the, be the effective force for bringing about the, the, the change process. We've talked about five skills that our research has identified, which seem to greatly influence your ability to lead that level three kind of change that we talked about earlier. And these five scale, skills very much reverberate against and with each other uh, and reinforce each other. And so we wish you well in your efforts to lead change within your organization. Uh, and Jack, one last note, nothing undermines change more than behavior of important individuals that is inconsistent with their verbal communication. Right? Thanks, John Cotter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he said it, didn't he? Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, we'd love to have some feedback from you. And so there's a, there's a feedback assessment. It should automatically uh, pop up. But if it doesn't, in the unlikely event, I've, I've given you the link right there, bit.ly webinar Jan 20. So just put that into your browser and answer a few questions, not a long survey at all. We just like your feedback. We, 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 we got our 360 feedback recently, Jack. That was fun, wasn't <laughs> yeah. it? Well, that's fun. Uh, listen, everything here on this whole webinar, you, you know, if you really want to understand how good you are at leading change, we have a 360. That's the best way to get that feedback. Uh, let us uh, talk to you about how we can measure your effectiveness at leading change and your organization's effectiveness. So do that follow-up survey. You'll get access to the development guide and you'll be able to download that. We'd love to hear your feedback if you have questions, if you have insights. Uh, this is a broad topic. We only skimmed the top of this, but I think we We've, we, we hopefully, what we've done in this, 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 uh, this webinar is given you some stuff to work on that we know makes a difference. So good luck.